Uh, Rob Rubel is a well-traveled Silicon Valley executive. Uh, I had the privilege of working with Rob in an in a office in Los Angeles more years ago than I care to mention. And since that time, he's gone on to do some really super cool things. Uh, he was the founding CEO of Ask, what is now Ask.com. It's called Ask Jeeves for a while, back when uh, all the search engines were just exploding. And Ask was right there next to Google and Yahoo and some of the others, even some names you don't know anymore. And uh, he was the CEO uh, of that company and took it to market, took it public, did some really cool things. He, uh, he rolled up a bunch of yoga studios into a brand called Yoga Works, so he's actually dipped over into a completely different category. He's run a handful of businesses, and one of them got acquired by the uh, uh, Apollo Education Group, which their most famous brand is, of course, University of Phoenix. And so he really became uh, a cutting edge innovator, executive in the world of education and education technology. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about that category. And so, uh, if you would, give a warm uh, UT at least have a welcome for Robert. Thank you, Mark. Welcome, welcome back. How was your trip? Uh, the trip this morning? Yes. At 4 a.m. from San Jose? Yes. It was fantastic. <laughs> But it reminded me going into that San Jose airport, completely jammed all the way at 4.30 in the morning with every person from every country around the world going, how did they do this time and again inside this little 100 mile area? Right, no. It's pretty impressive. Silicon Valley is a fascinating place. And uh, of course, I have a prejudice towards it. And we talk a little bit about it here, uh, particularly for those people who are interested in in tech marketing. Let's start with just a brief, uh, I mentioned a little bit about your history and about my start with you in Los Angeles in the good old early days. Uh, just give us a brief synopsis of your education at Yale and how you got to where you are. That, that's a brief synopsis. I started out much like all of you did, having no clue what I was going to do in the world after I, I left college. So at Yale I studied history, I was a huge student at the time because computer programming was just showing up in those days. Microsoft had been founded about a year before, and one of my good friends was like employee number six there, if you can imagine. And so I studied some computer science. I was fascinated by always about media, and I went into journalism. I worked on Wall Street, went into business journals, and that's where Mark and I met. But all along, I kept looking at what was happening in computer programming and software and this huge revolution. And I was trying to think, what's going to happen to information media? Because I was working for a magazine as a journalist. I didn't want to be obsoleted. And so I kept studying technology. I moved out to the West Coast, where we got to open up an office, studied everything going on in Silicon Valley. And when I found out that there were companies putting pictures and movies on CD, or at that point it was diskettes, um, I did everything I could to leave the field of journalism, join a company. So I joined a startup multimedia software company in 92. We were making Dinosaur Adventure. We actually made products like Jumpstart, First Grade. Maybe some of you guys even played these products. Math Blaster. We did them on diskettes, five and a quarter inch floppy diskettes, three and a half inch floppy, and then CD-ROM. And that was considered a major technology transition, a bet the company transition. And then from there, I got the privilege again saying, where is this all going to go with the internet? And so I started our internet division, got to build a company called Idea Lab with a guy, Bill Gross, who started GoTo, which was the paid search engine. And E-Toys and a whole bunch of companies, and then I went to Ask Jeeves, and it was, how do we make the internet easier for the rest of us? Did some time at Ask Jeeves, took it public, um, we sold it, and then did it, as Mark said, like I said, I can't deal with software engineers anymore. I'm just gonna go do something with yoga. I don't know why, crazy business idea. And then, um, and then ended up at Apollo after uh, heading up a small internet media and advertising company, and we sold it to them. And I ran everything at Apollo from marketing to technology engineering, and then recently became their chief innovation officer. Okay. So let's go back a little bit to, to Ask, because Ask Jeeves really, while it was a search engine, was really a media model. So you've been in tech media, if you will, for the better part of what, 15, 18 years? Yeah. Correct? Um, Fast forward to today, you're working in uh, education technology. 
which has a lot of interesting parallels <coughs> to the media business because much like movies and music and other items have become kind of on-demand consumables, this whole world that we're in today, education, is going to look a lot different in the coming years. Probably no less different than magazines and newspapers looked in your internet launch days. Let's talk a little bit about what you do at Apollo. Well, at Apollo, as, you, as Mark mentioned, we manage University of Phoenix, which is the largest private university in the country, one of the largest in the world, and the largest online provider, and really pioneered online learning. We also own a bunch of online schools in other countries, so we get to see what's going on in Africa, India, now in China, Australia, Europe, and it's amazing to see how people are changing the way they consume their education for a whole variety of reasons when they can use technology uh, to their advantage. And so what you find is what's happening is people in most countries can't afford this luxury of higher education we have. Our country is increasingly unable to afford it. So there's a huge debate about the government's funding of debt, student debt, higher education. So huge pressures on the cost of training people to be knowledgeable. Um, you know, you see in the world, most jobs, there are going to be almost no jobs that are unskilled labor. All jobs will re require some kind of skill or competency, and those skills will be technical, and they'll change probably at a rate of 18 to 24 months. You will have to learn something completely new. I mean, you look at like from C++ to Java to Ruby to Python to Django. I mean, the, the framework languages and programming have changed. I don't even know all these things. So then the last piece is, as people move all of this online, we're seeing all of this kind of content start to look and feel the way music content felt or gaming content. So how's that going to be get organized and how will you consume it? Will you do it on this device? Will you do it on an iPad? Will you do it on a watch? Will you do it in an Oculus headset with full VR produced by Samsung for about 500 bucks? So, you know, you really have to think, where's this all heading in the next five to ten years? Okay. So, you've got a presentation that touches on some of this, correct? Well, are these guys ready? I mean, you guys are in school, your parents are paying for this, or the state or the government's paying for your learning. Do you, you want to see? We may have people that are paying for their education. I know. I was about to get to the private payers. There's a smaller group, and they're, they're the industrious ones. Um, but, yeah, I wanted to kind of lay out a little bit of where we might see the world, and it's supposed to be a bit provocative. You guys should be really questioning. You're all smart people. Um, is this really what we think might happen? Well, look, and this is a great debate, right? Because you all collectively grew up in a K through 12 scenario that looks a lot like this, right? Where we all combine together in a classroom, and it's a one-to-many environment of learning, but it's kind of geography-based, right? If we will, sort of old school learning. Um, but education is probably going to look very different in the coming years. We know it's going to look different because some of those trends are already happening in this move to online learning. And so the, sort of the big question is, what does this classroom look like in 10 years or 15 years? You know, are we still sitting in this setting? Uh, or does it look dramatically different due to the use of technology? And, and then the fun part for you is what are all the businesses that spin out of that transition? Because there are companies like Apollo and others and a whole collection of other different companies that are not even in necessarily the delivery of an education product, but work on the periphery that are all vested in what these outcomes look like. So much like you look at uh, all, all kinds of different categories of online commerce, or computer hardware, or software, online education is a really interesting market that many of you may find your careers in too. So with that said. Yeah, I'm going to give you guys a few thought pieces here. And, and, the, and the reason I think this is also important is this is a class about where you think the world of media and technology and advertising are going. Education is going to become the next media platform and media experience. So for those of you who don't know, just in the US alone, if you take all of higher ed plus training and development that goes on in companies for all the skills you didn't learn here, all the professional development, it's about $700 billion. You can round it up to a trillion dollars in the US. Globally, it's four and a half trillion dollars is spent on education training worldwide. Here's what's wild, because everybody's got pressures of cost, convenience, it's just hard to get professors in rooms. 
about $140 billion of that merchandise, or 20%, is gonna move online in the next five years. So just think of that. Millions of little courses about everything from advanced manufacturing lathes made by Toshiba to statistics to general education courses on humanities. But you know, what happens with consumers? Do consumers like a lot of confusion? This is what it looks like when you walked into the majority of big discount warehouse stores. They don't like chaos confusion. They don't like to see a thousand statistic courses, a thousand of this, all with gray labels, maybe ones from University of Austin, they can't, in Texas, they can't tell if it's a good one. They do not like sitting in lines, not knowing what they're buying. So what's gonna happen is we're gonna see online the emergence of marketplaces. Things that are like Amazon, where you can actually quickly go in and consume learning, find the best value, find courses that people have taken that did great things for them, and you will be able to get a good return and be able to shop for learning the way you might have shopped for any other device or any kind of object. The other thing about learning and education is this is the extent of production value that we've had in education for many, many years. It pretty much hasn't changed from the 1800s. I mean, you guys are using computers, you go online to check the schedule, there'll be some stuff that you'll float around and get into groups. But look what happens when dollars are spent on a media. So this is the old film. I can't remember which old movie that was. It was one of the silence. 100,000 views was at a peak. And at that point, no one thought these things were ever gonna exceed a million. That's gravity, probably. $400 million went into making it, marketing it, and distributing it worldwide. It made a billion and a half or $2 billion in revenue. 100 million global users. I'm not sure if any of you guys actually played Pong, except maybe in a weird nostalgia arcade. But Mark and I were lined up in arcades playing that. That was the extent of entertainment on a computer. And of course, the computer was this large, and you had to go to an arcade to play it. That's John Madden football. It's a franchise with 100 million worldwide um, loyal followers. And they did everything from branding to licensing to ray tracing out where they hired MIT physicists. I was in the education marketplace when they were doing this stuff and we thought they were nuts. They spent $1 million on a title back in 1994. It was insane. Now they spend $60 million on the next rev of John Madden football. That's cable, C-SPAN. That was the idea of cable. We're gonna put hundreds of channels and you will get to watch really cheesy, horribly produced, poorly made up guys talk about civic government. That was the idea of cable, but the farmers will get access to their government. It'll be a new generation of democratization. Lots of production dollars later. No one said put money like you're gonna make a movie. Game of Thrones, six million viewers. Netflix goes, hey, let's take the same model and run it off your computer, off of streaming, and in less than four years, they have 44 million global subscribers. Because they said, let's go build proprietary programs like House of Cards and other things to drive our subscriber base. Here's education, that's 1950. Hey, that's 2000, this looks like us. Literally nothing has changed except this is a MOOC. I don't know how many of you guys have even played around with these massive open online courseware. This is the state of production value in some of the best online learning experiences. It's not anything that you guys or any of our kids will ever want to interact with. So, you know, where's this all heading? It's got to play on all your devices. It'll probably look a little bit more like the inside of World of Warcraft at some point. I mean, that's the way you drive global audiences. And then this last a couple pieces about we are now a personalization culture. We expect everything to be organized around this device. Eventually this device will be our watch and eventually will be get plugged into our brain. And the thing about learning is why wouldn't you get learning from the best places that give you the most value and why wouldn't you always have it tied to thing you want to do in life so the learning is always pushing you forward and paying itself off as you do it. Why is it that sometimes you take a course and go, why am I even in this course? And does it even count for me going forward with getting a job or switching jobs or getting a promotion? And then the last piece is just, why is it that we hear about boot camps showing up where guys are going in eight weeks, they're getting $200,000 programming jobs. 
Why isn't my learning and education in Mark's lecture on my Plasma TV set on my Netflix account? And why isn't it something I can just go and download a podcast, listen to it in the car? All this stuff is going to get integrated and seamless. And it'll be organized around your lifestyle, your budget, and what you're trying to do in life. Not, hey, you come to our institution, and then what you do with the rest of your life is your problem. Experts and teachers are the most important part of the equation because they convey and transfer intellectual capital to your open minds. But we've restricted the IP to mark at the end of a room of the teachers you have here. There are huge numbers of experts out in the world. Retired auto designers at General Motors, data scientists who work at Apple but would love to run an online course. They just can't fly out here and do this course. So what happens when we can take that group of experts and start to actually network them. So you can learn from a great professor who's at your school. You could learn from someone you always wanted to grow up and be like who works in New York. Or you could learn from an amazing data scientist who just happens to be in India. So we believe that this whole idea of the faculty, the experts, is going to explode into much larger networks of marketplaces of experts. And then the last big thing that happens in markets, and this is why it's always good when you see industries go, what happened with the iPhone and the smartphone? Music became, it was used to be something I had to buy a record or I went to a concert or it had a cost of goods sold, meaning every CD, every album, and every concert cost something to produce. When music was literally zero cost of goods sold, Steve Jobs was like, okay, except for the licensing, the royalty fee, if I can package that on a device next to your telephone, and oh, by the way, I can put a camera, a really cheap camera, and I'll put your email. I bet I can create a device that will probably wipe out and rearrange six industries, not just one. So education now has zero cost of goods sold merchandise. Video lectures cost zero. Simulations on how to run a data center or how to organize a farm or lay out an oil refinery cost zero to play over and over again. So when you have that, Highly disruptive, it means new players start showing up in the market and saying, I'll offer you learning that costs me zero, you'll pay me 10 bucks just for the phone call support. So when you start to see that happen, you go, here's something we've got down on the lower left. College and universities cost about $50,000 a year, whether it's government subsidized, you pay it, private, if it's at Yale, it's 70,000. But it serves a tiny, tiny fraction of the population, and you have to do it all at once, and then you have to leave, and then you have to come back. It's really, really challenging. People in the world love subscription businesses. They love to live up here where it's simple, easy, convenient. And oh, by the way, if it's next to my favorite TV show or my friends posting their photos, I'll do it all day long, and I'll subscribe. So we believe is all these forces will probably drive learning to the point where it's much more like a subscription business. It'll look more like 29, 19 bucks a month, $100 a year for lifelong learning connected to your career and success in life. So I just throw those as five little thought pieces. But you know, welcome to the future of education. A nice little smorgasbord. You just come in, nine bucks, all you can eat, all the success you can eat. So it's, the Sp it's Spotify University. We'll pay a subscription and I'll get my continuing education. Do you think it eventually replaces this experience? Is I think it adds to it. I think what we'll do is there's a whole revolution happening in what's called competency-based learning, which pretty much says, if you know something, why would I need to go fulfill the requirements? I mean, how many of you guys struggle to make sure you fulfill all your requirements before you graduate? And you're like going, if I know the subject and I could be simply tested, which we can do fairly easily, can't I just skip go, collect the 200 credits, and move on and take something I really want to take? So I think you're going to see blended models where universities like this can take advantage of that, but the student walks around with one learner profile in everything they do. So we had a dinner one night, and it was very interesting to talk to some seasoned executives. And this, again, was within the tech sector. And so some of this may be more targeted for continuing education in technology, because particularly those of you that are engineers or software engineers, staying atop of the latest technologies and platforms, whether it's coding or other disciplines, is a very important part of your career. But at this dinner, there were representatives from HP and Oracle and IBM and a host of major entities. 
and, the, and a lot of education smart thinkers. And the question was raised, do you care if your new hire has a college education or not? Okay? And as you might suspect, uh, the lion's share still had a preference for that <laughs> college education. Um, but there were decision makers at the table who were only interested in your competency. Now again, this is primarily along technology job types. But the idea was, I don't care if you have a diploma. What I care about is if I can give you a rudimentary assessment or testing mechanism, if you can do the job, I don't care if you have a diploma. So it's not so much that that replaces this four-year degree that we're all collectively investing in. Um, but at the end of the day, there is movement on the fringes towards this idea of it's less interesting to me as an employer as to where you sat in a room for four years versus what you know right now. And some of the evidence of that, there are some boot camps. You mentioned boot camps. We found a boot camp in Northern California in Marin that I think it was 10 or 13 weeks of training for maybe $10,000, $5,000, and 95% of their graduates were walking out to $100,000 plus a year programming jobs because the need was so there. And so you, you start to ask yourself, uh, if I'm going into the field of computer programming, and there's people that will hire me based on a boot camp that costs 10000 instead of 200000 and it's 13 weeks instead of four years, these are the kind of changes that are happening in the marketplace. And while we are all collectively of the old school and uh, uh, format, it's important that the idea of continuing to learn is important. And so these technologies help us yeah. stay. Is, would that be fair? Oh, yeah. And I, and I think this doesn't point to one future. Whenever an industry like this that has so much cost, so it's so critical in a knowledge economy, what you guys are doing in these four years and what you'll do learning beyond this is the most important asset you'll build, period. There's no other better asset. You can buy a car, you can buy a house, that might go up a little bit. It's your knowledge capital that's everything. And com companies realize this, countries realize it. So we have to find new and unique ways and entrepreneurial models for delivering it at scale, dramatically lower cost, and maybe the cost thing at higher return on investment, you know, so. And it, it was also important too, because while I, while I talk about all these opportunities to uh, bypass a traditional four-year degree, there's still the other benefits that you get from being a part of this four-year experience. So let's make no mistake, you know, there are a whole collection of other things that you learn, the socialization, the independence, and other things that go into the maturation of being in a four-year school. And most appreciate that and will for some years to come. But again, to your point, it's not an either or. The point is there are opportunities that really can happen in an accelerated fashion without going through the traditional model. And because the cost is so much less, you think about fifty thousand dollars a year for you to be here, whether it's by your parents, your own aunt, student loans, etc. That's a tremendous amount of money, and so that's why there's so much being spent on trying to develop these technologies. And if you've been on a MOOC, who's been on a MOOC? Anybody participated in a massive online course? None, really. Okay, so um, I'll give you a data point. Uh, MIT did an online MOOC as an introduction to computer science. They did it globally. Any idea how many people signed on to do this MOOC free of charge across the globe? Clue? 98,000 people globally. So think about that idea that one person, significantly smarter than yours truly, is actually conducting <laughs> lectures with 98,000 people concurrently across the globe. And to Rob's point, what was the cost other than the professor's time, right? You're pushing bits through a pipe. It really didn't cost anything. And so when you think about that extreme example versus $200,000 a year for traditional education, you can see all that space in the middle is driving a lot of innovation and a lot of creativity around, okay, this institution's not going away, but we have to have technologies that make it more affordable and offer greater reach. And that creates phenomenal opportunities for your generation to create value, commerce, income, salaries. There's just a lot going on in this world of education. Yeah. No, I, I, and I think the other part that you find, and maybe this is the, the very positive view I have of technology, it always has these interesting bumps and, and when we introduce these powerful new technologies. But I mean, you're really empowering people, in effect, 
to take charge and manage their life how they want to do it. And so the idea of an education, someone going to a community college, transferring here, then saying after a year, I'm going to take a year off and I'm going to go to Europe and I'm going to work or I'm going to go to Asia and I'm going to work inside a Korean semiconductor company or a media company. Then I'm going to come back, I'm going to take a couple courses online. So think about the freedom. We're already doing that now with all these kind of networked universities and people going abroad for a semester. I think, you know, as we globalize, as people want to have more flexibility, richer, more interesting experiences. I mean, you know, four years of hanging out at the frat can be the best thing on the planet Earth. It might be you take two years plus a year in a frat in Paris. I mean, and I think these kind of technologies enable people to have the flexibility. Taking a year off and working and still getting credit for school. I mean, that's, that's the kind of thing that all this stuff, it sort of loosens up the institutional hold everyone has on the individual. You know, you also, one of your slides was about the quality of content. Uh, and most like you kind of contrast C-SPAN with, um, with um, uh, I forget which one you use, Gravity or one of the movies. Right. The idea, that's another thing. So when you look at content in education, this class excluded, a lot of the formats that you'll see in online classes, I mean, they're real sleepers, right? So if you've ever sat in front of your computer screen and had to suffer through a really boring online course, you know exactly what I'm talking about. In fact, I would argue if you've had an online course, it probably was a rather boring collection of, of content and experiences. And so the model is to the degree that we will spend money to bring more entertainment or at least production values consistent with what you see when you see a movie or cable television or Netflix or a great video game. If the quality of that content comes up, We've learned from those other categories that you will consume that product. So if you can take the art of teaching and make it interesting, put it in multimedia, and deliver it in a way that you want to watch, it's not much different than the old line uh, defensive driving courses versus you know, uh, comedy defensive driving or some of the more fun environments. If you can make it entertaining and you can give it a production value that's consumerable, you'll watch it. And that's pretty fascinating when you think about the mobility that Rob mentioned. Imagine being able to continue your courses in an online capacity from Spain for a year, not falling behind, but doing them on a desktop computer right. or on your mobile device and having the opportunity to work abroad and think of what your life and your learning experience could be like in that setting. And so you can kind of start to do a little bit of big dreaming about where this can go. And these are not quantum leaps in technology. The technology is really here. I mean, it's here today. 98,000 people on a MOOC globally. One guy talking, whiteboard, showing different programming attributes. 98,000 people interacting and listening. So the technology really exists. The learning platforms, the learning management systems are there. What it really is, it's about the content getting good enough to attract you as an audience. And even more importantly, it's about changing how we think about education because we have big institutions like our own and others uh, that change comes kind of slow to. It's, it's a, it's a, it, this is part where both Mark and I started in the media world. And so we've always been fascinated how fast and rapidly, and everybody's held beliefs about what should be in media. So when we were starting out, there were three national networks, NBC, ABC, CBS, and then there was this sort of weird UHF stuff where they showed professional wrestling, roller derby, and some Jack Lane videos. Um, yeah, I know you guys don't know that, but um, it, and the thing that you could do is it was such an amazing thing to even introduce the concept of cable television and what are we going to do with 500 channels? Actually, and that debate went on for 10 years. We don't have anything to put on 500 channels, so they just plugged it up with local crazy program. The best they could do is New York came up with a newscaster wearing a bikini who was an ex-stripper. And that was about the highest rated show. But then, yeah, Robin Bird, yeah. But what they started doing is crazy entrepreneurs said, this is nuts. There's all this space. No one knows how to sell it. I'm actually going to create a channel called Comedy Channel. And it was like, you're going to do what? And VH1 or E. 
MTV, and they're gonna, we're gonna run music videos, and they just created this industry, or comedy channels, just reruns of all the stuff you used to watch at set times, they play it all day long. And then guys were sort of looking and saying, wow, I know, we're gonna create a cooking channel. All day cooking, that's the most boring topic on the planet Earth cooking or gardening or but then they thought and said well why don't we make it a competition we saw this Japanese show about iron chefs suddenly they took Julia Child these crazy quiet little Sunday shows about chopping up your celery and they made cooking a competitive event with this guy from Japan mediating a battle between top chefs and now there are four cooking channels there's three house and garden channels they've made these things all people have become stars. So you think, what's the difference between cooking and information technology or marketing and advertising? It's, it's, you know, so these things are not, there's just gray lines between when you're teaching a skill and when you're actually making it entertaining. So I think it's great for people in your position, you can peer out in this world and go, wow, what is the spot that could become the next major franchise that they don't have on the channel yet? So think about an education channel by topic, you know? How do you take content? Because really when you think about it, education is not really a different category relative to sports or cooking or home and garden, et cetera. How do we take content in the world of transferring education and turn it into something that's interesting enough that it would have the ability to be sold as a consumable? How do you shorten the length so that you could watch it on a mobile device? How do you create an engaging idea? Maybe it is a competition, some other format, but how do we take this experience and turn it into something that can be packaged and consumable to turn into a business? And that's gonna be a, not just a multi-billion dollar business, that's a trillion dollar business. And there's so much effort towards this because of that cost savings that this is such a huge opportunity for you to go out in the world to try to find your own way that it's one of those categories that, trust me, it ascends computer hardware, it ascends computer software in terms of dollar volume. This is such a big opportunity if you can think creatively about how to do that. There's a group of guys out of um, Salt Lake City. It's a company called Pluralsight. Maybe some of the techie programmers have been on there. There's a, there's a big Pluralsight fan. Five guys used to train all the guys in Salt Lake City tech skills, and they do it in classrooms with PowerPoints. And they were making good money, but they had no lives because Salt Lake City has a good tech community. And they said, this is ridiculous. So they took a bunch of cheap online tools, didn't even really go overboard with production. And then they just called up their best friends and said, hey, would you do a course on this Microsoft desktop certification, Cisco network, uh, we've got an EMC cloud computer. And they built these little courses, broke them down. They started this business six years ago. They're doing $100 million in revenue. They have $40 million in profit, split between five guys each year. And they just raised $150 million at a billion dollar valuation. So that's just, and everybody looked and said, too nerdy, too cheesy in production. But they went and they got the best experts to produce these little simple courses. And guys who want to be current and competitive, just load up. It's a subscription, 29 bucks a month and you get all the course where you want. Normally you'd be paying $2,000 for that Cisco course. Uh, anybody use lynda.com for anything? Yeah, okay. So you know the models are out there for this idea of buying small pieces of education and they can be topically driven. It can be how to change the oil filter in your car to how to learn computer programming or, or to learn the basics of desktop publishing. But the idea that you could go in and pay for expertise exists today. We do it in this setting in a one-to-many in an institutionalized format. Online we can do it, we can pick and choose. This idea of almost like a playlist, you know, like your music playlist. What are those things that are interesting to me? Increasingly in the future, it is gonna be what are those things that are relevant to me in my career? What do I need to stay on top of to continue to advance at my job or not lose my job? See, there are also billions and billions spent by corporations to keep you literate in certain topics. And so this idea of buying incrementally these pieces of knowledge are going to be very important in how you perform at your job and keep your job. So, yeah, fair enough? No, absolutely. Okay.